Hi guys, here we are at uh, part two of your fluids lecture. Uh, this one's about Pascal's principle. There's only seven slides here, but they'll probably take me a bit of time to explain. They're not easy to understand. You should have your paper printed out by now, and you'll probably have to sit through this twice to get all of the information. So Pascal, old guy, 200 years ago, they named this stuff after him. Pascal's principle is the pressure at one point is equal to the pressure at a second point in a fluid that's contained inside of a system. So pressure is equal to force over area. So the most important thing on this page is that, um, well, on the left, for a confined and compressible fluid, the pressure pushing fluid in equals the pressure pushing fluid out. So over on our diagram here, in pressure one, if you press from here down in the little tiny thing and the fluid is trapped inside this system, it'll press up on this side. So, sounds simple enough, but when you come over here, if you have a small force of five over an area of one, it could give you 500 over an area of 100. So the ratio of it will give you a huge force out by, by putting a baby force in. So um, when you think of hydraulic brakes, and I've put a video of that on Brightspace, um, that's how they work. You have a small force with your foot, and it creates a big force that can stop all four wheels of your vehicle, which is a very cool and wild thing to think about. So that's how hydraulics work. For a small force, it'll give you a big force. So down here in all of the equations, force over area equals force over area. That's the most important thing to understand. But you can also turn that into uh, force over radius 1 squared, force over radius 2 squared, force over diameter 2, that sort of thing. I don't remember any of those. I only remember the top one. F1 over A1 gives you F2 over A2, and everything else will work if you just remember that first one. Um, so, an example. Imagine a wine barrel and there's a 12 meter long, so that's really long, thin tube is inserted into its lid. So, you got a wine barrel, you got a long thin tube. When the barrel and tube are filled with water, I guess I should say wine, but filled with water, the barrel will burst. So, that seems strange, but <clears throat> again, you know, you've got <clears throat> 12 meter long thin tube. So what you can do is work out the force of the lid on of yeah, the net force on the lid of the barrel. So the pressure is the same at each um, area throughout. So that's the big Pascal's principle. So the pressure on the lid and the pressure on the tube have to be the same because they're a, a fluid that's contained inside of one system. So on the lid, the pressure is F over A, and the uh, pressure in the tube is, as we found out in the last class, pressure is um, rho g h. So, um, so that's another way to put your whole force over area can be converted into rho g h. So that will be the pressure in the tube. You've got the density of water, gravity, height of the water, and the area. You fill everything in and you see that it didn't seem like much, but that long thin tube gave a force of 14793 newtons. So again, that's hydraulics. Another example. So this is the one with a car braking system. A driver applies 1,200 newtons of force to a 0.5 centimeter radius pedal. There's eight one centimeter radius caliper pistons pushing brake pads onto the wheels. So again, a little baby force from a grandma driving a car can stop all four wheels. So calculate the total force applied by the caliper pistons and the maximum distance one caliper piston moves. Um, I don't know if I have that last part done there. I think this is just the first part. So the total force applied by the pistons. So again, we know on the left, pressure in equals pressure out. And uh, from that is um, force 
over area, pi r squared, pi r squared, and they've canceled both the pi's to just give you radius in, radius out. So starting with that as your equation, you fill in the force in. The force in is on the 0.5 centimeters. This was left in centimeters. It should really be in meters, but it's going to cancel anyway, so who cares? So that's okay. We're going to get newtons out of it when we're done. So that's a force in, the radius in, and the radius out is one centimeter, and there's eight of them, eight one centimeter radius caliper pistons. So then your force out is 38,400 newtons for such a small force in of 1,200. All right, different concept but related is Archimedes' principle. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but a couple of hundred years ago, um, you know, when I used to teach science camps and stuff, I'd tell the story, the legend of Archimedes. That's, again, another guy's last name. He discovered and was playing with buoyant forces, so they say experiments in the bathtub, and then, uh, you know, ran naked through the streets uh, because he'd figured out buoyant force. The story's probably not true, but he probably was doing experiments in a bathtub. He was trying to figure out the buoyance for, buoyant force up. So on the bottom here, you've got FB equals true weight. Let's say you're 100 newtons. And then your apparent weight when you're in water, let's say. And we all know if we're swimming and you try to lift someone in the water, they, they don't weigh much, it feels like. So if your true weight was 100 newtons and your apparent weight when immersed was 80 newtons, you know that your buoyant force is your true weight minus your apparent weight. So your buoyant force would be 20 newtons upwards. So that's kind of what the water gives you. It makes you feel lighter. So this is a spring scale, which means a scale that you can hang something off of, and it, it gives you a uh, how many newtons you have. So a mass suspended from a spring scale. If you put it in fluid before and after, you can see that it weighs less. Again, if it was 100 outside of the water, it would only weigh, say, 80 when it was in the water. So the buoyant force is a force that pushes upward. And your FG, your force of gravity, is still your force that pushes downward. So we're going to get a bit into force up minus force down and what way the thing is moving, like when we learn forces. So the buoyant, buoyant force equals the apparent weight loss for an object, and it points upwards. So far, so good. All right, so buoyant force, this is an interesting thing. I've always found this interesting. It equals to the weight of the displaced fluid. So for instance, if you took a shape and you put it underwater, and this shape right here, if you could cut out the shape and weigh that shape, let's say, let's pretend it was jello, and you, you took that shape, the buoyant force is equal to the mass of the fluid, <clears throat> mass of the fluid displaced times gravity. So it's like the weight of the jello, if you could take the shape of that jello. <clears throat> so, for instance, the buoyant force is equal to F2 minus F1 from our diagram, force down, force up, then a bunch of math stuff. And we get the buoyant force is equal to the mass of the fluid displaced, which is density times volume, and then times gravity. So this equation here is similar to the blue one up here. The buoyant force is equal to the mass of the fluid displaced, which is density volume, times gravity. That will be really important. That's your buoyant force, and you're often asked to figure out buoyant forces. <clears throat> you don't need all this math stuff. This is just kind of where it came from, but that's the final verdict. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> hard, complicated problem. We have an anchor, <clears throat> and um, it's going to go upwards. <clears throat> Coughing fit. <clears throat> So a chain pulls up on an anchor, and the specific gravity is this, which means the density of the fluid that it's in is 7,207. We got the mass of the anchor, and it's being pulled up with 400 newtons of force. The anchor is immersed in salt water, and now we have the density of the water, and this is the density of the anchor. 
7207. So then it says calculate the anchor's acceleration. <clears throat> so there's a lot going on there, but at the same time, there's not. It sounds complicated, but when you come over to the diagram, you've got the force of the tension being pulled up, the anchor being pulled up. The buoyant force is an upward force that we don't know. And the force of gravity is the force down. So the buoyant force is going to be equal to, like we saw a screen ago, density times volume times gravity. And you would need the volume of the of the displaced fluid, as if you could cut out the volume of the anchor. We'll get to that. So <clears throat> to solve this problem, you need this section here. And this section 2 and section 3 are things that are done aside because we get stuck in this main problem. So here's the main problem. The net force is whatever's going with it minus against it, just like those force problems we used to do. So MA equals, with it is buoyancy plus tension minus the force of gravity. So you start expanding things and filling things in, and you realize you get down so far and you don't know your buoyant force right here in red. So you're stuck. So underneath there, you could write the word stuck, which is what I would do if I were doing this on the board. You come over and you say, okay, the buoyant force, you don't need this all this math stuff. The buoyant force is just density, gravity, volume. And the volume D means the volume of the displaced object, meaning the volume of the anchor. So you expand that and you realize I don't have the volume of the anchor and you pop over here and you have the density of the anchor. You got the mass of the anchor so you can find the volume of the displaced fluid, which is the volume of the anchor. You pop that over here. Now you got the volume of the anchor and you get the buoyant force upwards on the anchor. Yay, hooray. Then you can draw an arrow back to the thing on the left and you fill in your 3209 because you got stuck and you had to go aside for a second to fill out your thing and then get your acceleration. So that was it. Calculate the anchor's acceleration. Next, a rock appears to have a mass when immersed in alcohol. Calculate the rock's volume. All right, so you've got the force of gravity minus the apparent weight equals the buoyant force. So that is the equation that you have to invent for yourself. So we know that it's a, a rock and the we can find the Fg, which is the force of gravity in air, so that's fine enough. And then you've got the Mg is the force of gravity in alcohol. So that's your apparent weight, which is going to be equal to the buoyant force. And this V is the volume of the rock, and that's what they want us to find. So we expand everything, fill in what we know, and then you get your volume of the rock. You'll have to sit through this video a couple of times and pause things. It's it's uh, feels like I'm going a bit quick. There'd be questions, and you'd be staring at this on the board. So you'll have to uh, look at it a few times. <clears throat> Alrighty, I think this is our last one. We have a diver with a density. Calculate the mass of lead needed on the diver's belt to make the diver neutrally buoyant. Now, those words, neutrally buoyant, underline those. That means the forces up equal the forces down. You want the diver to stay at a certain level in the water and not float up and not float down. That's neutrally buoyant. So with this problem right here, we could say that the net force is um, the force is up minus the force is down or this thing could have been and the net force was zero or you could have started this first line and said the force is up equal the force is down both the same thing so if the force is up equals the force is down you expand you've got the buoyant force of the diver is density gravity volume then the force of buoyancy of the lead, density, gravity, volume. Then you've got the force of gravity of the diver and the force of gravity of the lead. So there are your two objects that are going on here. So from the diagram over there on the left, you've got 
um, the buoyant force of the diver, so it wants to pop you up to the surface, the buoyant force of the lead, then the force of gravity of the diver, and the force of gravity of the lead. So it seems weird that there's a buoyant force of lead, but the lead is still taking up space. So it does have an upwards force that the water would push on any object that's submerged. Even though the lead would win and it would sink, there is a buoyant force because lead does have a certain volume. So you expand and fill all these out. Again, you could have the two up equals the two down. Fill in what you know, and then it, it uh, makes sense from there. And then you can get the mass of the lead, which is 2.25 kilograms. So that's our last example of um, fluids. And um, that ends our fluid section. So if there's any questions, just let me know.